So I think we were going to start with uh, just quickly reading like very micro sections of the book. I don't want to like just read a book at <laughs> you. Um, that's really boring. Um, so we'll just start with that and then we're going to have a, a bit of a conversation and then throw, uh, throw it to y'all and then hopefully be kind of like more like a group conversation. Um, uh, I think this topic and the way we've talked about it, it really shouldn't just be us up here uh, lecturing at people about what we know because everyone in here is a part of the struggle and can bring everything uh, back there. So. Um, did you want to kick us off? Sure, yeah. Um, so, fascism, uh, we often like to start with like a definitional thing, because a lot of people are kind of unclear, like what is fascism, what do you consider fascism uh, is, and um, you know, the right likes to say that fascism is basically shutting down free speech, which uh, technically is absolutely false. Um, because fascism is a deliberate ultra-nationalist ideology, right? It sort of goes to a blood and soil understanding of like uh, who belongs in what place, uh, directly emerging out of like ethnic structures, uh, usually using some form of biological or cultural uh, racist formulation um, in a patriarchal reassertion of uh, natural elites uh, instead of a sort of egalitarian uh, ideology, right? So this is not shutting down free speech at all. It's an ultra-nationalist ideology bent on genocide and uh, really kind of the furtherance of colonialism and imperialism. Um, a lot of it, fascists present like anti-imperialists, but this is a total uh, falsity because fascism really gets its momentum from uh, sort of stealing the left's luggage, if you will. Like uh, the left says this, so fascists, the, te the, the term is often like think with the left but stand with the right, you see? And so they'll appropriate basically everything that the left does that might be attractive and use it toward that ultra-nationalist revolutionary, in quotations, um, movement to overthrow uh, the liberal center and replace it with a hard authoritarian ultra-nationalism. Um, and so one, one particular example of this is uh, with the turn of fascists appropriating anti-fascist stuff. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, sort of movement that happened, it, and it came out of Germany as the, uh, um, the wall was coming down and the Soviet Union was falling apart. Fascists started to crib the styles of Antifa groups. Um, so I'll just read like a really micro section about that <coughs> from my book, Against the Fascist Creep. It's the one with the decapitated Nazi. Um, in 1989, according to scholar George Katsiafikas, an alliance of Antifas emerged to coordinate Germany's anti-fascist action. Protests against neo-Nazi mobilizations and police support brought together thousands in black blocks. It was this vibrant movement, as well as ecology struggles like the UK's anti-roads movement and animal liberation, that proponents of the new trend toward left-wing fascism attempted to enter or co-opt. At one point, German neo-Nazis approached Antifas to offer a deal to form a joint alliance against the police, but they were rejected out of hand. Failing entry into some kind of coalition, the Nazis attempted a new approach. In 1992, former member of the FAP and associate of Kunin, Christian Warch, developed a new strain of Freie Kameradschaften attuned to a co-optation of the autonomous, autonomous style um, one of its anti-anti-fascist tactics was to publicly reveal the a uh, addresses and names of anti-fascists. I have simply adopted and adapted the networks of the leftist autonomen, Warch boasted. This trend was embraced by the March 12th group, which developed into a new Brown International based on national Bolshevik geopolitics. They call it Brown International based on the SA's brown shirts, right, from the 1930s, uh, 1920s and 30s. Um, 
The group called itself the European Liberation Front after Yaki's group of the same name in, in the 1950s. Within two years, they would have a European Secretariat and would have organized themselves under a non dogmatic evolism, including a rejection of the system and the globalization of McDonald's. With, the with Thierry, Southgate, Boucher, and others, the ELF could coordinate strategies across nations. For, ex for instance, an effort to infiltrate environmental parties in Spain, France, Germany, Poland, and Italy. As Southgate and others on the neo-fascist left broadened the scope of Strasserism and national Bolshevism to include national anarchism, national resistance, and left nationalism, a general exchange of ideas facilitated in no small part by the ELF was taking place between Europe and the newly emerging Russian Federation. Scandal shook the world of letters. What the hell? <laughs> oh, the world of letters as in like lettered people, like academics and shit like that. Is that what that means? <laughs> yeah, that's what it fucking means. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Scandal shook the world of letters. I said it right that time. No, you did good. <laughs> As the post-68 satirical publication Le Idiot International, once supported by Jean-Paul Sartre, invited Benoit and Russian fascist Edouard Limonov to participate in the editorial board and write columns. In 1992, traveling to Russia on behalf of a revived ELF to meet with political leaders, Jean-Francois Thierry had an important effect on the ideological direction of post-Soviet politics. Robert Stoikers and Benoit also played a direct and ongoing role in reorganizing the political spectrum of Russian politics by providing Russian neo-fascists with access to networks works within Europe and by traveling to Moscow to assist in strategy and planning. So I know that's a little bit heavy. There's a lot of names. It is page 170, so it's further than halfway through. So you, you read the text and actually get that history and start to realize how the modern Russian Federation was shaped uh, in no small part by fascist <laughs> intrigue. Thanks for passing it off over to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, I know Shane, yeah, you, you have a, a reading that you Yeah, said? yeah, so I'm just going to read, it's only about a page and a half. Basically, I wanted to kind of shift us back a little bit to the American context. Uh, and back to the election, uh, not because it's the only important thing, but it's something that we kind of all remember, and it's some nice signpost in our memories. Um, I'm from Portland, we're both from Portland. So I remember that day and the kind of the day before and the few days afterwards of just thousands and thousands and thousands of people all together overwhelming like the city infrastructure. Um, and so I wanted to kind of just bring us back to at least that headspace for a minute. Um, so, so bear with my public reading voice. Um, the morning of November 8th, 2016, election day, the majority of Americans knew that Trump would not win. NPR the, NPR, the New York Times, and 538 were uniform about the narrow path to victory that Trump had to the White House. The NPR Politics podcast discussed this as a near impossibility unless he miraculously won states like Ohio, Florida, New Hampshire, and West Virginia. 538 set his chances at 28.7%, and the upshot set it at only 14. As the day wore on, social media posts began to increase in speed and anger. Against the odds, Trump took Florida, then North Carolina, then Iowa, Indiana, and West Virginia. Next, Michigan and Minnesota went into play, defying not only pundits and pollsters, but also historians and political scientists. Then Pennsylvania went red. Videos and eyewitness accounts of Trump rallies during the campaign year portrayed a frightening cacophony of reactionary anger, where racial slurs were belted out with salivating venom and protesters were colored field for their lives. Build the wall became a common taunt to provoke immigrants or to simply show that there was a united white front against their personhood. That attitude only amplified once it was validated by Trump's election. In the 10 days after the election, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups, listed almost 900 reported hate crimes, a number so astronomical it had no precedent. Muslim women reported having new jobs pulled from their heads, while Latin American students told stories of being surrounded in lunchrooms as white students hurled racial slurs. White nationalists have a revolutionary vision, one that opposes the state and dominant white culture as much as it does the left and non-whites. It wants to reimagine this world as one that is exclusively for white interests, where the strong rule over the weak, where women know their place and gender is firmly enforced. They have reached into the culture and gotten a firm grasp and are going to use this moment in the sun to grow, to expand their influence and to make themselves a militant threat to the values of democracy and equality. 
The challenge for those on the left, the organized faction interested in greater human equality, is now to understand who the alt right are, what they want, and what they must look past the and they must look past the, past the contradictory phrasings and confusing tactics to do that. The incidents of reactionary violence, the mobilization that figures like Trump and his racial scapegoating has inspired in working class people, and the mainstream of explicit nationalism has made real the threat that was only in the background of for many political battles over the last 60 years. Fascism has never been silenced exclusively by its own ineptitude, but instead by the concerted efforts of organizers that risk everything to stop it. Fascism attacks at all of our movements. From the labor movement to anti-racist struggle, the growth of the LGBT fight to that over ecological liberation. Fascism makes these battles intersectional since it acts as an orchestrated attack on the core constituencies of all of these movements, making real the idea that all oppression has a common center. Fascism is an attempt to answer the unfinished equation of capitalism, and instead of challenging the inequalities manifested through this economic system, it hardens them. With Donald Trump's election, this worst case scenario, fascism taking a hold now seemed possible which added material impetus to movements on the left to link up and take charge. It changed everything. Right, so, um, uh, you, so, so you talked there, um, you, you hit on this uh, theme in your work that the challenge for the left is to fully understand the alt-right and how to approach it. And there's been a lot of kind of shakeups with the alt right in recent uh, months, mm -hmm. um, and I think right now Matt Heimbach and the Traditionalist Workers Party is sort of being thrust to the foreground a little bit. There's been a there was a, a news story out about them, and in which they, uh, uh, in refuting the news story, actually admitted that they had infiltrated the Roy Moore campaign in Alabama. <laughs> But the inter other interesting it wasn't too hard. Thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other interesting thing about them is that their ideology, while they approach from like an Appalachian down home sort of like we're just like the friend of the miners in in Appalachia, um, their ideology comes from a kind of syncretic uh, Duganism. This uh, ideology oriented around the uh, geopolitical thinker from Russia named Alexander Dugin. So they kind of exhibit this weird transnational fascist presence that utilizes localism in a kind of white working class type movement. And I was wondering if you could talk about them a little bit more because your book does such a great job, you know, exploring and illuminating and like dragging these guys out into the sunlight and show like what they what exactly they're trying to do, right? So mm -hmm. so so could you talk a little bit about them in the context of what's going on in the alt right right now? Yeah, um so, so for people who don't know, the Traditionalist Workers Party was a white nationalist organization that started a few years back as the Traditionalist Youth Network, and it was just on campuses, um, mainly Midwest and East Coast campuses, and they were doing things like starting white student unions and uh, um, doing that thing that's so tired now of like, why can there be a black student union and not a white student union? And they used that to kind of enter into um, basically university administrations that didn't know how to handle it and didn't know how to like create refutations of that and then it ended up basically defending them defending their presence against an organized uh, resistance um, they got older and developed this this kind of program which was to basically exploit financial crisis to exploit uh, crisis in exclusively white working class communities so like opioid addiction that's a really major point for them it's a way for them to be like oh this is a this is a white issue that kind of thing and they use the language of anti-capitalism so what they're the anti-capitalism that they're against is international anti-capitalism a very thinly veiled anti-semitic caricature of anti-capitalism so you know it's the Rothschilds it's these international elites um, uh, a lot of times they drop the air quotes and just go with you openly um, but basically what they have is a kind of uh, traditional national socialist they want socialism for white people only. So a state that basically monitors things to preserve quote unquote white interests, whatever they think those are. But it's basically the state's going to be there to promote uh, white sovereignty and white exclusivity. But what they've done was decided that unlike a lot of other alt-right groups which really wanted to go for like upper middle class college students, they would go for those too, but they would also really try to embed themselves in places hit financially really, really hard. So they would do things like data research and find the lowest um, socioeconomic status 
uh, areas that went for Trump the most, and then they would do rallies there. Um, they would do um, uh, food drop-offs and drives. Very similar, for example, kind of a mirror image of Redneck Revolt in a mm -hmm. way. They would do like, look at what Redneck Revolt does, food drop-offs, needle exchange, they would do some version of that. Um, and then they would try and connect with working class communities where unemployment was hitting 40 or 50 percent, um, especially really heavily in West Virginia, in um, Ohio, and in Indiana. Coal jobs are drying up. There's a lot of problems going on. And they would have basically take an anti-capitalist message and give it a really heavy racial twist. Um, and so there's hard to get numbers on all these groups, but they're numbering clear, closer to about a thousand people. Um, and they're doing actual on the ground organizing work, unlike a lot of the other ones which are really stuck online. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, where they're going next, all of these groups, the Traditionalist Workers Party, but then the rest of the alt right, I think is the big question. Um, there was a point at which, in the middle of last year, they had to do something. They had maxed out their ability to you know, dominate memes and hashtags and things like that, so they had to move out into the real world, otherwise there was nothing, nothing left. Um, at the same time, they started to, to cut off their more moderate kind of uh, counterparts. You know, Breitbart wasn't on their side anymore. People weren't mainstreaming their message. And so they decided to just throw all in on some big public event. It was going to be just them. It was just going to be everyone to the right, the white nationalists and to the right of them, neo-Nazis, Klansmen, alt-right figures. And they were going to go to Charlottesville, and they were going to have one big event and prove that they're able to stand on their own two feet. Um, except that event turned out a disaster. A mass movement formed against them. They got shut down both because of their own violence and because people just refuse them. Um, they've lost it most of their platforms. I think we were just talking about this the other day. Um, every social media platform from Facebook to Tinder has blocked them. They don't exist really in the way they did before. Um, and so now there's a certain amount of desperation of how they're going to organize. And so what they're focusing really heavily on is these large public events. So traditionalist workers party would focus on things like areas in Appalachia where they could do these big public rallies and they would do something really broad, you know. We're against global banks. Well, who, who likes global banks? No one does. Um, at this point in history, being against global banks is about the easiest thing you can do. Uh, and it speaks to that common language. Um, the other side of the alt-right, the Richard Spencer, uh, well-coiffed hair, uh, khakis and white polos, um, are focused almost entirely on, on colleges, specifically mm -hmm. on state schools, because mm -hmm. they, they have a, a precedent legally to have the state school protect them since it's a government institution. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems to be the direction they're going now. And it's been really tough to see which one's going to be more fruitful for them. They're certainly able to recruit in college Republican circles. Um, and kind of the frat boy culture. I don't mm. know if I mean to throw throw frat boys <laughs> under the bus on this or not, but yeah, <laughs> but, but very heavily, you know. Um, and so a traditionalist workers party, on the other hand, is going at basically people to the right of the militia movement. Mm. And they're going out and they're not just doing things like talking to people, but they're actually providing services. They're showing up and saying like, hey, we can give you rights to the hospital. Um, we can do things like you know, do food shares. We do, um, for example, very well coordinated child care systems that the left could only dream of. Um, and those kinds of things, they go a real distance in rural America right now as like there's fewer jobs, there's no social services, and like people are really struggling to get by. So yeah, that's the direction I think they're at. It's almost like, I mean, like shifting to like the Pacific Northwest where they don't seem to have as big of a presence. Um, we have an issue here with the Proud Boys, right? And, um, and Joey Gibson's group, right? Patriot Prayer. Well, like Tiny Toezy, who's like Joey Gibson's right hand man, is a Proud Boy now, right? And there's a group that started out way more of like pro-Trump militia style and then just gradually sort of like rolled down like a that snowball type like whoa now they're just like proud boys like how did they get from like the militia to like Fred Perry shirt like traditional skinhead <laughs> they ruined Fred Perry yeah well it's 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 uh so so like this kind of showed like a trajectory in a way of like Trumpist, uh, independent Trumpism, I guess uh, Spencer Sunshine calls it, right? Where like uh, the Trump supporters kind of delinked from his authority while maintaining him as kind of this symbol and then uh, went their own strategic way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is this resentment against liberals 
which is grounded in the fact that instead of using their power to enfranchise and better the conditions of rural areas, Democrats have tended to punish rural areas for voting Republican. And so there's an animus, right, against liberal centers, college towns, cities, and you see these guys coming in, usually from rural areas, to Portland and just being like, hey, I'm here, my Kekistan flag, like, <laughs> let's rock, you know, as basically provocation, incitement, uh, intending to anger people so they'll react, right? <laughs> like their whole theme, it's very psycho-reactive. It's, it's a phenomenological process. Sorry for using that word, but it's like they, their whole movement is organized around operationalizing people's trauma in order to strike them psychologically such that they'll have to respond. They'll be in a place to respond physically you know, because that's how trauma works, right? It's like fight or flight, you know? You just like in a bad place that you need to get out of. And that's what their presence does in the city. It shifts the city to their power, right? Because they're directly violating people's safety. Um, <clears throat> and There's a heavy focus on Seattle right now, too, which I think is worth talking about. Has anyone heard of the Northwest Forum? Yeah, sounds like the most innocuous, boring thing no one would ever want to go to. Well, you still don't want to go to it. But, um, so uh, one of the largest white nationalist publishers is this outfit called Countercurrent. So they kind of model themselves on like left-wing publishers like Verso. They're going to put out these books. They were going to be kind of academic sounding. They might resurrect old philosophers. The idea was they wanted white nationalism to look smart again. Um, and so they started working with uh, the less smart group of people um, uh, and doing large white nationalist podcasts like The Daily Show, uh, uh, you know, play on the word for the Holocaust, ha ha. Um, and what they were doing was creating these regional meetup groups. They wanted to bring people that were online and bring them into a physical space. And since countercurrents leaned more academic, they were going to do sort of like an academic like speech type. Um, started with the New York Forum, and they, what they were doing was these private and invite-only events in uh, you know, different rented halls. They looked really innocuous, and no one kind of was the wiser, and they started doing them every month. And then they expanded out to, to Atlanta, to Chicago, to Detroit. There's a Cascadia Forum in Portland. Um, and a big, big, big center of it is the Northwest Forum in Seattle. So the founder of Countercurrents, Greg Johnson, moved here, decided to start setting it up here, and is trying to do these, I think, quarterly now, but it's becoming a really kind of go-to event. And they've been able to really mobilize lots and lots and lots of people from around the country to make this a center for trying to develop that. What they want to do is take like the, the cultures on the coasts they see. They like the academic culture. They like... You know things like craft beer and what they call basically inherently white culture you know like an exclusionary liberal white culture um, and they want to kind of create their basis here and I think that's one one way that they've really actually kind of started to expand out in this direction and it's really important I think to uh, it's kind of it's a little boring because it returns to like 19 uh, discussions that have been going on since you know uh, decolonization became like a uh, sort of winning movement after World War II, very roughly speaking. It's sort of like, yes, European civilization has co-opted literally every advancement that humans have ever made and turned it into a white supremacist narrative. Right? You can go back to Sheikh Anta Diop's uh, book, uh, C Civilization or Barbarism, where he breaks down all of the ways that historians have, classicists have co opted mathematical revelations that came out of Egypt and Africa for Greece, right? So Greece becomes the center of modern civilization by shifting all of the innovations of, of humanity from Africa and the Arab world. And this we've seen also with uh, colonization of, of Africa itself, right? Um, when the Portuguese went to Western Africa, they wrote home, and this is 15th century, they wrote home about how, how clean everyone was, how the streets and the, the cities were actually like highly civilized, no worse than Europe. And then 
fast forward to the, the super colonial period in the 19th century, and you have the exact opposite narrative. And they're forcing people into palm, uh, African palm plantations, um, murdering millions and millions and millions of people in order to get their rubber and their African palm. And what do they use the African palm for? Soap making, right? So it's like ethnic cleansing and genocide of uh, the people of the world by European civilization has been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, fascism is, I call it in my book, a force majeure. Like, it's the momentum of that colonization process in the most extreme form, returning to Europe and ethnically cleansing Europe, drawing from the crusader tradition, drawing from the colonial tradition, and furthering it. Um, whereas other tendencies in, uh, the, in the European context sought a more international, an internationally linked movement for uh, global liberation. Which is not to say, right, just as a caveat, that the social democrats were particularly wonderful in their own right. You know, like in the 19th century and early 20th century, they were actually arguing for colonialism and imperialism and wanted to enter World War I, right? So, the problematic nature, right, of, of uh, European history is one that we really need to contend with if we're actually going to fight fascism on our terms, mm -hmm. right? Not on terms of someone who will turn around and betray us, <laughs> which is what we've seen time and time again with uh, radical movements. But <clears throat> that's not to say that uh, anarchists can afford to be completely exclusionary and anti-fascist organizing. And I think one thing that your book draws out is how anti-fascists have organized, right, um, to shut down fascism using, more, using broader platforms and access to different communities, different soci social groups, different uh, economic scales. And uh, so I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about a little more about the legacy of anti-fascist organizing and uh, how to stop, how, how, how it has successfully stopped fascism in the past. Right, right. Um, I think what's, what's been unique over the last few years is that it's really opened up what that term meant. So like anyone that looks back to like the 70s and 80s, what's the image of anti-fascism? White dudes in the streets fighting people, period. Um, and there's a whole kind of legacy of, of where that kind of tradition had come from, and a lot of it comes from uh, the logic in the late 70s and early 80s of white people policing their own communities and taking responsibility for, for what's happening in white communities. Um, what we've seen over the last several years is the ability of a mass movement to form that has lots of different kernels that takes things at different starting points and in different areas. We've seen areas coming out of uh, organized labor, um, which is sorely missing in other contexts. Um, we see like synthesis with Black Lives Matter and the importance of confronting police brutality and systemic anti-black racism um, and finding that being totally cohesive together. Um, we've seen um, the growth of um, environmental movements doing the same thing um, and people being willing to take on different strategies and different organizations based on different affinities, different personalities, different backgrounds, different life experiences or limitations and things like that. So on the one hand we have lots of militant anti-fascist organizations which are fantastic and have directly confront people in the streets. We also have ones that do organize really mass actions. They're able to kind of overwhelm fascists in physical space. Uh, both of those can work conducively together and not just kind of as uh, in opposition to one another. Um, and so over the last two years, two and a half years, along with the rise of Trump, is that we've seen a huge influx of people that are turning these events from kind of maybe smaller confrontations to really large societal confrontations. Um, we were talking about a few, few examples of this. So we're in Portland. People probably remember this really tragic stabbing on a train um, in the springtime. So um, basically there was a guy who had been participating in what was called for a while those free speech rallies. Um, obviously not really free speech rallies. <laughs> They're all right meetups happening in like city centers. Um, he'd been participating with those. Um, he, he found uh, two women of color on a train, decided that he was going to uh, stake his claim on attacking them. Uh, a couple people got involved and two people were murdered. One person sent to the ICU. Um, the people that he had been organizing those free speech events with decided that right afterwards they were gonna go ahead and have another one. 
Um, so there was about uh, 200 or so of them. A lot of people came from out of town. It was a big event for them. But they were met by 4,000 people. So on one side, we had a labor coalition with a lot of like trade unions um, and a lot of Marxist organizations. On one side, it was um, a lot of kind of uh, more like left progressive organizations, housing groups, environmental groups, some NGOs. Uh, and then um, Rose City Antifa, uh, PNW Northwest Anti-Fascist Workers Collective, IWW folks on the other side uh, that were pushing into them. Every side of them were uh, surrounded and 4,000 people completely overwhelmed them. At that scale, we're talking about like dozens of organizations and movements working in tandem to completely shut this thing down and to totally overwhelm its capacity to recruit. Um, right after Charlottesville, some Proud Boys and some other alt-right people wanted to organize a similar event in Boston. They were able to get about 150 people together and 40,000 people came out and just shut the event down. When 40,000 people come out in the streets, there is nothing they can do. Police can't stop them. The mayor's office can't stop them. A state of emergency can't stop it. There's literally nothing to stop it. Not only did their event not go down, but this was a huge organizing for organizations on the ground that were going to do long-term work because it didn't stop with the Proud Boys. It continues on with police violence. It continues on with workplace organizing and all of that. And so I thought that is a really big huge change mm -hmm. um wasn't i and, and uh i think i'm pretty sure um queer women of color were kind of forefront of mm -hmm. organizing that in boston and, and in chicago yeah, pretty yeah pretty absolutely much, yeah pretty much everywhere and that was erased <laughs> almost entirely by media color you know? coverage yeah um i think that actually brings to one question we had given to us when we were setting this up but it's also like the i think it's the question that we should be talking about a lot in these events is how do we decolonize anti-fascism? Because um, it's like a term that goes a lot, but I don't, it hasn't been elaborated on. And so I, I had thoughts, but I thought this also might be a good thing to like, you know, when we bring up and, and when we're talking uh, about different ideas, because it would be really remiss for, for two white dudes up here to decide exactly what that means. Right, yeah. Um, and so um, I think one of the things um, was that, well, with understanding the logic of a lot of like white anti-fascist organizations in the 80s, it created problematic dynamics of all white organizations, period, um, which I think are limited, obviously, by experience, but they end up being really limited in scope. And so I think one of the things about confronting that dynamic and being open about it and trying to like obliterate that kind of homogeneity was a really important. And I think that's something we're starting to see, but it should be done a lot more intentionally. Um, and one of the other ideas that we would spend time talking about is that there's a really heavy focus on really just looking at Europe and North America and what those struggles mean there. Um, essentially, like you said, when colonialism was, was turned back on Europe, but not seeing it in the context of ongoing colonialism, ongoing imperialism, and then also the replication in just other countries. And so there's anti-fascist struggles that were against uh, in Imperial Japan, um, like massive anti-fascist movements in Jakarta, mm -hmm. um, in Chile, and other places that we completely have ignored. The whole anti-apartheid movement, right? I mean, like the, the uh, apartheid South Africa, you know, is is often forgotten in terms of how, just how right wing uh, that mm -hmm. you know government actually was, but there was uh, effectively a fascist organization called the Bruderschaft or something like that, which uh, kind of ran a lot of the corporate corporate and political uh, life uh, in South Africa, right? So. Um, the struggle against uh, uh, that apartheid regime was sort of de facto anti-fascist. Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at uh, Amilcar Cabral, right, in uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau, um, fighting against the Portuguese forces, this is also a kind of a, a, a forgotten part of history, but the CIA was running a network of fascist provocateurs and um, militants who would blow up infrastructure sites in Italy, uh, like the train station in Bologna, uh, Piazza Fontana in Milan. The police had a network that was established after World War II of fascists who would cover it up and blame the left, round up a bunch of anarchists, throw one out the window. and. Um, and then the fascist bombers, assassins, etc., would escape to Franco's Spain, Salazar's Portugal, which were effectively 
you know, para-fascist, fascist countries, and would also be used in the colonies. Like Portugal had colonies, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And, um, and they would uh, basically, you know, serve the colonial purposes. So Amilcar Cabral actually wrote a letter to Portuguese anti-fascists saying, we're in the same struggle. It's not identical, but mm -hmm, we're against yeah. the same people. And if we don't collaborate, we'll probably both lose. Like, you in Portugal must resist colonialism, just like we in Guinea-Bissau must resist fascism. And these kinds of struggles are happening in Latin America too, right? The Ar Argentina, Paraguay, uh, Brazil, uh, Chile, right? Uh, like, fascist wave of, of uh, 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 people escaping um, war crimes trials moved to Latin America and set up shop, helping these dictators torture and uh, kidnap and murder um, left wing left wingers. Not even always just militants, like journalists and te professors and teachers and stuff and priests. And um, and so the resistance against those uh, regimes, right? Pinochet in in Chile, uh, the. Uh, movement, the revolutionary movement in uh, El Salvador, right? I mean, these, this, is, this is a big map, right, of, of, uh, of fascist movements that uh, spans the world and that the CIA, in fact, helped orchestrate, not only set up, but orchestrate. And the deepest irony of it all, the historical twist to it all, is that the same people who were brought into that movement, that underground fascist movement, are now cooperating with Russia in attempting to overthrow the liberal democracies of Europe and the United States, I guess. So, <laughs> so it's like the same exact people. Talk about like momentum, you know, like. And I think it's also especially uh, important right now with nationalist movements in South Asia that are going after uh, Muslim minorities and like uh, basically what are our, our pogroms that are basically just racist assaults that are murdering people in mass numbers. And the fact that we don't think of that as a fascist movement, even though it hits all the check boxes in yeah. a sense, um, it has the same kind of history and, and like especially with Hindu nationalism has like a, a history of collaboration with the far right in Europe. Uh, the fact that we're not seeing that means we haven't put it in that context and we're just continuing basically colonial mindset of not refusing to see these as international problems and continuing to see them as ones that's defined only through Western le leftism in some way. Yeah, and I, I, one, of, one of the funny, and this is just kind of like, I mean, we should probably turn it over for audience questions at, at some point, but mm -hmm. um, just like one of, the, one of the ironic coincidences of history, maybe not coincidences, one of the more sort of meaningful historical uh, uh, facts is that the first person who was ever actually called a national socialist um, was a French guy, uh, Marquis de Moore, who moved to the United States in the late 19th century to the Badlands because he wanted to live out that ideal that Western, that, that Western Europeans had of the cowboy. So he set up a meatpacking uh, plant in the Dakotas and worked with Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who was a rancher at that time. Um, the two ended up butting heads. Um, but Marquis de Mores ended up moving back to France and participating in the uh, notorious anti-Semitic Dreyfus Affair uh, with a gang of uh, butchers, <laughs> literally, who would wear cowboy hats and boots. Real spectacle in Paris. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt, of course, brought his eugenics ideas into the White House uh, with his conservationist buddy, uh, Madison Grant, whose book, The Decline of the White Race, ended up on Hitler's table. Hitler called it uh, uh, one of the, his Bible, his Bible, that's what he called it. So, you know, we got like the emergence of fascism from the colonial expansion, the internal colonization of the United States and its furtherance through, ironically, the progressive movement symbol of uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his buddy Madison Grant, who inspired Hitler with his racist and xenophobic ideas. And he was a conservationist. 
so that's the thing. That's what I try to, to really kind of draw out in my book is that apparently innocent themes like environmentalism, you know, um, anti-imperialism can be distorted by fascists and used against the left by pulling people out of it and toward violent ultranationalism. Um, yeah, and I think, I think one of the other things that's important uh, that we both try to, to draw on is that the alt-right, what we have today, is the largest fascist movement in decades, and it has a direct lineage to the past. Um, there, what we saw in media coverage for like the first year or so was this idea that it was sort of like fascism light. Like, oh, you know, it's maybe memes, maybe they mean it, maybe they don't, maybe it's more of an anti-PC revolt mm. or some other kind of silly jargon. But in reality, these are white nationalist ideas that have been around for decades. Um, and what they're doing is kind of reinterpreting themselves for a new social media landscape, one that de-emphasizes politicians as important and one that kind of has brought the internet celebrity to dominate. And what they've been able to do under that cover is recruit in such massive numbers that people are kind of incapable of understanding exactly how large um, they were until they began kind of bringing that online culture out to physical space. Um, which is why I think now we're actually starting to see the effects of a large mass movement and organizations that are coming out to stop them. Um, and that's what I think is the most positive thing as we're kind of coming into 2018, is that their growth has started to shrink and be halted back, not because of their own ineptitude, but because people stop them. And that is literally the only thing that will end it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You want to open up? Yeah, let's open it up. If you all have questions, we can keep on going back and forth. We do this all the time. Um, this is like our road show we do, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, lay it on us. What do y'all have? Questions, comments? Yeah. There are a lot of people nowadays that call Trump a fascist, me included, and, uh, and, and, and characterize what they call Trumpism mm -hmm. as a form of fascism. I do that in other words nowadays to some extent. Is that a characterization that you agree with? And whether you agree with it or not, um, how do you how do you measure you know Trump and Trumpism uh, within the framework of those elements of the definition that you're an advocate for in terms of what constitutes fascism? Oh, you wrote an article called Trump the Fascist. I did, so. I did write an article called Trump the Fascist. He had a double entendre there. <laughs> uh, um, tough, tough crowd. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I was really... I watched that rally that he did in Mobile with Jeff Sessions came up on stage and somebody in the audience shouted white power. And I was just like, um, I have to say something about this and y'all aren't gonna like it. <laughs> um, because the, the, the thing that particularly sh uh, 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 sh surprised me was that he went directly for the 14th Amendment, which is the Reconstruction Amendment after the Civil War that gives civil rights, uh, uh, well, that stresses civil rights for all people and the the priority of the federal government to mandate and enforce civil rights over and against whatever the states want to do right so going after the 14th amendment is often seen or interpreted or presented by the far right as uh oh we're actually just going against like birthright citizenship right <clears throat> which yeah um, yeah, totally non-racist, right? Uh huh. So, but it opens the door for what I think "Make America Great Again" actually means, which is the unreconstructed South. Um, I don't think it's pre-civil rights movement, 1950s. You know, uh, squares are cool. It's hip to be square. I think, I think it's way more insidious than that. I think uh, uh, the Elder Bundy kind of uh, uh, let it slip that time when he was saying that uh, uh, black people were better off as slaves, mm -hmm. right? I think that that is the underlining, uh, the underpinning of Trump's 
white rage. Um, and so I wrote that article and um, people, I had mixed, it had mixed reviews, I think. So um, I, I backpedaled a little bit in order to please the scholars, um, saying that basically we can't fully know Trump's, you know, hidden sort of like what he dreams of at night. Although somebody with the Hitler's speeches in his armoire, like armoire, weird, right? Um, you know, you were right to be a little bit suspicious there, but he still has the sort of machinery of the liberal state to pin him in, right? So he can't be, be like, especially not all of a sudden, this kind of authoritarian Il Duce, right? He can't be the sort of the leader overall, right? He's checked, there are balances to his power and things like that. Um, so I kind of, this is part of the reason why I wrote this book, is to say that the far right, which encompasses the, the radical right and fascism and the ultra right, is way more amoebas than we can, you know, strictly discern uh, by breaking it up into uh, little boxes of you are radical right, you are fascist. In fact, if we look at radical right parties in Europe, a lot of them came out of the fascist movement. The, the FPO in Austria was literally a, a container for disenfranchised Nazis that was formed after World War II and then morphed into a political party, right? The Front National, right, was, it came directly out of a fascist group that was saying, how do we get out of the fascist ghetto, right? That's the French radical right party. So when we look at the radical right, often we're, what we're actually seeing is a fascist movement that's walking around with sheep's clothes on, right? Like, we believe in parliamentarianism, we're cool, but like, Mussolini did that too in the in the early 20s. Hitler was doing that in the early 30s. It's just you know all it takes is the the um, the Reichstag burning down and then you have the enabling act and Hitler taking complete power. Um, so it it is a little bit you know anxiety inducing that that Trump keeps saying, you know what would really bring this country together. A horrible catastrophic event. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, don't want to see that happen, right? So, so, so it's a complex question. Thank you for asking it. And I don't think that there's anything but a complex answer that takes me 200 some odd pages to flesh out. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, think, I think what's less, a little bit less important about whether or not Trump's a fascist is what does he enable to take place. Um, so, like, if you look at a, a, a fascist country, there, there is always fascist ideologues. There are people with crazy, wild fascist ideas that are made in a tiny minority, and they kind of console out, and they basically enact kind of uh, these acts of, spon it's like, seemingly spontaneous violence. But they don't really threaten state power, you know. I wouldn't have said, like, the Klan of the 80s or something was ever going to take uh, the reins of the federal government. But, like, Trump essentially is also what we call, like, a populist, right? He kind of gets this kind of working class angry, tries to direct it into a rightward uh, uh, faction. Does that allow people with fascist ideas to actually ride their ideas into the public consciousness? And I think that's absolutely, unquestionably what's happening. Uh, they do. They focus on a few axes: anti-immigrant anger, Islamophobia, and they're able to change, channel that, and basically take what were white nationalist talking points that were just specific to white nationalism, to tweak the language just slightly and ride a wave in. One thing um, there was. Uh, I want to kind of fast forward. Uh, fast forward. Geez. Rewind. Um, uh, in 2016. Um, a number of people were trying to shut down uh, the Hammerskin Nation from having a music event. This was in Brooklyn. Every year they have uh, one of the Hammer Fests take place in Brooklyn. Um, and uh, one of the, the issues that they had was some of the skinhead bands they had actually were like multiracial members. Uh, and when you looked at the stuff, it was multiracial, like we support Japanese nationalism for the Japanese and uh, white nationalism for white people and a lot of very, very, very heavy focus on Islam. It was just a very, it was like a, a string on each one of these bands, Oxblood being a good example of them. Um, 
And so when we started to do the groundwork of contacting people and saying like, hey, this is a problem, let me show you, um, where said there, people would say things like, um, okay, we see that, but that's, I mean, that's not radical, that's not new. Uh, it would have been 16 or 17 months before that. Like what they were saying was virulently, violently, almost genocidally Islamophobic stuff, except the president, the pr person who became the president said the same thing like a week ago. It didn't shock people anymore. People weren't moved by it. It actually became very, very difficult. And I think that's kind of the, the danger of Trumpism in a lot of ways. Um, because he ideologically, who knows? I don't think he really cares that much. You know, he sees he drums up a lot of anger, gets him a lot of power. He's kind of a resentful person and a shitbag himself, so he doesn't mind drumming that up. Um, and that's uh, enough of what the, the the fascist right needs to be able to start injecting those talking points. And to be honest, and we've seen this historically, it doesn't take much and it doesn't take long. Um, that kind of anger, especially that white rage, that like white resentment that they want to tap into, um, that can fuel very, very quickly and can create like a really big cauldron of violence. Yeah. Um, kind of piggybacking off of what you mentioned about violence, I was um, my interest was piqued when you mentioned um, earlier about um, working with uh, militant um, anti-fascist groups and my question is um, the anti-fascist movement has received criticism in the past for being for inciting violence destruction of property blah 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 and my question is is it necessary is it a wise idea to partner with militant anti-fascist groups who may engage in violence or is that sort of just um, gives the alt-right just more ammunition to mm. um, to um, criticize the and does it does it get, does it present the wrong image I <coughs> guess is what I'm trying to say um, tell you well, I think one one fascinating thing that I've heard you say <laughs> um, is is that um, is that the the fact of militant anti-fascism has because like Daryl Lamont Jenkins says, who does One People's Project, right? That that anti-fascism is a consequence, right? That. Anti-fascists are the consequences for hate. Hate has consequences, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's the slogan. And, um, and the, the fact of anti militant anti-fascism has uh, become more public because fascism has become more public. They're coming out of the shadows. And the only way that they've been able to come out of the shadows is they've had friends on the official right, the conservative right, who have partnered with them in the, in the name of free speech and that sort of thing. Milo Yiannopoulos is a really good example, going back to Breitbart, going to uh, the Mercers and the CNP and the Trump campaign, um, Bannon in the, in the midst. Um, but um, s that like broad front that's been formed between right wingers from the far right to the conservative right or, or what was once seen as moderate has brought um, anti-fascists out in numbers and also expanded the, the numbers of anti-fascists and you know um, brought militant anti-fascism to the fore so it has it's cre they have created a situation where they've really embarrassed themselves and it's forced them to take on Antifa as their main enemy, mm -hmm. right? So they're going to say, don't look at us, look at Antifa. Antifa is the worst thing in the world. Pay no attention to the fact that we're hanging out with Nazis, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's nothing that an opposition movement can do short of being ineffectual mm -hmm. that won't receive that kind of attention and that kind of ire yeah. from the right. I, I think I also, I, I'm not willing to concede that anti-fascists are violent. Um, if... <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, I, um, it's your mom. <laughs> um, 
if oppressed communities, if people uh, standing up are being attacked, them defending themselves is not violence. It is never violence. Um, and that's historically what we're seeing. When the three percenters, which is like a patriot militia group, shows up with SKS assault rifles and then yells about the violence of people in bandanas, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just not the case. Um, so what are the numbers that we have? Over 25 people have been murdered by white nationalists in the last 12 months. How many had people were killed by Antifa? Um, it's just flatly an untrue comparison. Um, and the other thing is that, that Antifa now means, at least in these right word things, I have a Google News alert for the word Antifa. 95% um, heat street, Breitbart, and the whatnot. Um, it could be anything. What did they do the other day? Um, are trans kids the result of Antifa parenting? Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know if that you word gotta means what you think. question. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, uh, so it, it's a caricature that they create whether or not reality manifests with that. Um, and historically, it really has not. Um, I think it's also, we need to put it in historical context, there is no social movement that doesn't have a militant wing historically. Um, I, there is also no social movement that achieved its ends in purely legal means, no social movement in the history of the world. Um, and so for people that set that expectation of those movements that like every single person involved conforms to X, Y, and Z standards of behavior is just really unrealistic and not historically accurate. Um, and I think, and also when you look at them, there's actually very little confrontation between the left and the right. It's actually very, very small. Um, the vast majority of work is the good old fashioned, boring organizing work um, that people have done for years and years. Um, and I think historically, if we look, anti-fascists are involved in less violence than the labor movement, um, than, uh, than queer liberation, than all these movements that, that uh, liberals and centrists love to celebrate decades later. Um, and so I think that this image of, of Antifa violence, whatever that means, has been one that's been really propped up by narratives um, that aren't our own and aren't accurate. And also because of the fact that um, with the kind of Trump phenomenon, there was a blurring of the lines between like Beltway conservatives and actual neo-Nazis and fascist movements, that that conflict spilled over into a different sphere of folks that weren't used to it um, and didn't under kind of understand what that dynamic was and I think that confusion also created a certain kind of cloud that was inaccurate there's also the the the, the problem of the racism and sexism of the stereotype of Antifa right that like Antifa is a white you know dude um, whereas it's it's not and that stereotype is almost perpetuated sometimes by Antifa groups. Um, it's usually the white dudes with privilege who the media goes to. Um, it's usually, you know, uh, white dudes who are the most sort of outspoken public anti-fascist. And often within Antifa groups, it's women, trans folks who are behind the scenes doing tons and tons of research, coordination, support, and the militant stuff, but not really receiving the credit. And so it's almost like the right is furthering a, a, a crisis within our movement as well, which, is, uh, uh, which has to do with sexist and, and uh, uh, white privilege. Um, so, so that's something that's, that's, that's important to kind of like, it's important to mull over and, and, and work on and, and like highlight the work of, uh, uh, anti-fascists who are non-white, you know, non-cis dudes, uh, Zoe, uh, Zmudzi, Zmudzi as, uh, uh, Sazmudi. Hmm? Sazmudi. Sazmudi. I'm sorry. I'm just bad with names, um, has a really great article. Um, co-authored by somebody whose name I don't remember in Roar magazine talking about uh, anti-fascist uh, movements led by uh, black people and um, basically how black social movements have been anti-fascist as long as you know fascism has been around and before that anti-clan and you know like so anti-colonial so so that takes a lot of unpacking that like 
If we zoom in to anti-fascism, which is directed at a real current threat, um, we need to expand our understanding of social movements to see also how interlinked, you know, um, the sort of ecosystem of solidarity, international solidarity, actually is. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's that's some some more challenging stuff that you know I don't think we've seen as much uh, v sort of vetted or discussed in public. <laughs> and I think also they don't need actual violence to call things violence. I mean they were doing they've been doing that for years now at Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter. Yeah. Um, uh, regularly publishing articles about Black Lives Matter terrorists. I, I can't think of something more bizarre than saying that. Um, and so, at any point in time, they will paint to the left as whatever they want, um, not depending on facts. I mean, the, the, the shooting in Seattle was a really great example of that, outside the event from Miley Annapolis. Um, someone was shot by his supporters, yet Breitbart published, I mean, dozens of articles, it seemed like, about, you know, that it was uh, IWW terrorists <laughs> um, that, that came and instigated that, that it was them bringing the violence, things like that, so much so that that's actually a part of people's talking points. Now, people actually believed that to be true. Um, so that kind of counterfactual narr narrative depends no matter what the left does. Yeah, and I, I mean, again, going back to some, some stuff that you've said in the past, um, uh, Black Lives Matter tapped into this, you know, like, really intense, like, base fear that a lot of white right-wingers have and had of black-on-white crime, you know? That was the, the thing that Dylan Roof allegedly looked up on Google, I think it was like black on white crime and it led him to the Council of Conservative Citizens, which tapped him into the alt-right. Next thing you know, he's wearing like a Rhodesian flag and, you know, colonial, you know, uh, this, that, and the other. And then, you know, murdering people in a church. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's that, that fear of, of, the black man especially, right? Like, Franz Fanon talks about it, like, phobogenesis, like, just produces this kind of phobia, right? Um, and, and Black Lives Matter is a situation of, of black people coming out into the streets for a social movement for, to be, you know, treated equally. I mean, literally not to be shot without reason you know, in public by law enforcement officers and with impunity, right? And not just law enforcement officers, but civilians. Um, so it's pretty simple demand, right? <laughs> pretty, pretty simple uh, theme, right? Like Black Lives Matter, does that scare you? Like, I represent that, you know, like we represent that. Um, but that was really a turning point for a lot of people on the right and they just went straight to Hitler. I mean, it was like, don't pass go, don't collect $200. Now, like, jackboots. Yeah, it, 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 it's just, it's really perverse to watch the movement against being murdered being called violent. Like, it's yeah. just, it's bizarre. Yeah, but it, it, it's it's also part of that, that latent hypocrisy, right? Of the, of the, oh, like, activists are snowflakes and like we're gonna trigger you and all that kind of stuff and then like <laughs> your animosity towards police officers is a hate crime <laughs> like <laughs> you are you are violent to me when you told me that i have privilege police the real press press yeah, yeah 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 don't police me with your politically correct rhetoric Could you talk about um, memes as a tactic that the alt-right used on various video game forums and anime forums as a tool to recruit these subcultures into your movement? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was incredibly effective because mm -hmm. um, what they were tapping into um, was like a culture we hadn't made sense of at the time. 
Um, so, like, one of the things, especially in the... Uh, people are probably aware of 4chan, 8chan, these web forums that are so notorious now, is that there was sort of, like, this iconic classic culture of, like, we'll be offensive for offensiveness sake, and, like, we'll do this and that. And, and by doing so, we're actually bucking this social infrastructure of ethics and morality or something. Um, and there was a meme culture that had kind of developed on there. It was self-referential. People would alter it and reshare it and do all those sorts of things. And basically, White Now Shows picked up on that in a really clever way of saying, like, well, if they're already saying offensive stuff, let's have them say our offensive stuff. Um, and so they were able to kind of give something that was kind of angry but apolitical a political meaning to it so like it had lacked in substance and they gave it that substance and that really happened in a lot of ways by mobilizing just virulent misogyny and anti-woman hatred um and by doing that through what later became gamergate uh which was like the harassment of female journalists for no other reason that they were men um and they picked up on that reactionary anger they were able to kind of weaponize it and they continue to do that because in a lot of ways and this is true that the left is, it has a more serious streak to it now and the right wanted to basically poke holes in that by laughing at it and they, you can do that very seriously you take a very serious issue you turn it into something that's no longer serious and it lacks a meaning and weight and it lacks mm -hmm. the ability to communicate that seriousness to another person they did that really really well mm -hmm. um i think now that the entire culture understands and like, like we people implicitly kind of get memes and the way that that communicates a lot better. I think it's lost some of that power, and they're trying to reclaim how they do that now. Like, how do they create their in jokes? You know, um, their real breakthrough was cuckservatives. People remember that. Mm -hmm. So it's basically taking like a racist porn trope and making it uh, conservatives who don't uh, work in their own interests on immigration. So they'd be calling them cuckservatives. Uh, that's actually what broke them through before Trump was even a serious candidate. Um, that was that hashtag and all the memes associated with it. And then hashtag alt right came next. Um, and so they, they've done lots of versions of this. Um, you know, anyone that's been called a soy boy online or something. Like this is just their attempt at kind of like picking up that steam again. Like if we get people to laugh, they start laughing with us. Um, and that's it worked really, really well. Um, but it ne didn't necessarily, it worked really well to develop the rhetoric and a lot of people kind of thinking, but it then didn't necessarily translate to an on the ground social movement, which is why they were really unprepared when the left actually came out with people. And I mean, a lot of them, a lot of fascists are people who are attracted to radical issues and then turn toward ultra-nationalism as the vehicle for expressing that radical rejection of the modern world. So you find a lot of fascism is like, we need to destroy everything, right? Clear out reality and build a new world, a new age for the new man, right? And these are fascist themes that are basically archetypal. Um, Roger Griffin calls it palingenetic, which means like rebirth, right? A kind of like rebirth and the phenomenology of it is good. Sorry to use that word again, but like gets back to Heidegger and the philosophical aspects of it. Um, returning to bare life, being in time, um, outside of the anxiety and the terror of modern life, you know, and we can breathe freely in our kind of Nietzschean elite, you know, um, fantasy. Uh, and it internalizes a lot of uh, issues like uh, in an archetypal kind of way, like Jewish people are representative of the anxiety of the modern world the everything holding back the true Aryan person right um, and with regards to memes memes enabled the computer culture to try to rep to try to produce a new reality in public and the alt-right gave them space to do that Joey Gibson has given them space to do that they put up their Kekistan flag and Half of it is about jokes, at, well, not even half, like less than half is about the jokes, but like, you know, it's really about staking a territorial claim for Nazism to thrive in that kind of 
reality, like reconstructing a reality. Like for the Nazis, it was and the, the fascists, it was really important to have control over the culture, uh, to have control over the the movies that were being made. You know. Um, to bring into line all of society through aesthetics, to put the swastika friggin' everywhere, because it represented the downfall of the previous regime and the beginning of something important and new, right? Catastrophically new. Um, and so memes help them imagine through that sort of computerized world a kind of you know way of destroying you know modern reality and creating new reality and they often use lefty memes and re you know purpose them for uh, uh, you know their desires like Pepe is a good example of this right like Pepe the poor Pepe yeah, yeah poor Pepe um, started out as just this kind of like pot smoking dude who didn't it was just kind of like frog cool, dude, yeah. cool frog dude <laughs> and was and was transformed through the fascist uh, uh, intervention in 4chan's poll section <laughs> into a Nazi and they did the same thing with the uh, the pigeon right that was uh, yeah yeah, yeah the and, and so so they, they try to like yeah they, uh, they try to also use that <laughs> subversive humor you know, that they kind of picked up from the left in a lot of ways, from countercultures, like uh, um, the, D the Daily Stormers uh, editor and creator, Andrew Anglin, was like a raver kid, you know, who was sort of like attracted to lefty uh, counterculture and ideas before he, he turned into this sort of... Went full not, yeah, Nazi. And Andrew Eggler actually says a lot. He's like, you know, just joking in the way I was just joking until I stopped joking. Yeah. You know? Like, it was just jokes until it wasn't jokes anymore. And Orenheimer is the same way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's the that's also the part of the permissive sort of online sphere that's part of the, the, the intense problem with it is like, no, how about we take this seriously, right? Because it's always just trolling. It's always just moving a little bit further, right? And this is really where they pioneered that kind of like, if you have an emotional reaction, you're weak, right? And 4chan really kind of started, it, 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 it like, its core in my opinion, when it was first emerging, uh, uh, the, the sort of political core was laughing at people with disabilities and at using ableism as a kind of explanation for racism, sexism. It's like everybody who's inferior, right? And just like, and in a way they also have that kind of like self-deprecating attitude of like in the men's rights circles that they, they all call each other betas right and they call themselves betas and they identify with school shooters and people who have like you know um intense difficulty in social situations right um they call themselves basically like autistic that kind of thing like they're self-deprecating constantly and that's part of i think that internalized uh, self-loathing that is externalized as hatred of the other. Yeah. So it seems like a common thread in a lot of things you've been discussing is that the right seems to be very good at popularizing and mainstreaming their ideas in a way that it seems like the left really struggles with. Um, and they're good at getting their phrasing, their memes, their ideas, and therefore their philosophy um, into the public eye and into like mainstream news publications. Um, what can be done about that? <laughs> Well, the left used to be good at that. I mean, it used to be really, really good at it. In fact, it was bad at organizing at certain stages and was good at that. Mm -hmm. In fact, like in the uh, you know, late 60s, early 70s. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really tough because on the one hand, they've been good at mainstreaming some of that messaging. 
Uh, and they've done it uh, at the cost of building a movement for themselves that's able to meet goals. Instead, what they want to do is get ideas out into the public consciousness, which may or may work for may or may not work for them. Um, and they focused almost entirely on, on immigration and Islamophobia at first, um, because those are things that could have some crossover into the GOP to get public policy. Um, in a lot of ways, the left has done this on other things. Like we've been like dedicated and confronting transphobia and making that basically untenable in the public consciousness, right? Um, and we've gone after it in a lot of ways. I, I think what they were able to pick up on though is that there's still reactionary white anger um, in a lot of places. Like <laughs> racism still exists in liberal America, right? Like, and they knew it. And uh, um, I kept kind of coming up when I was writing about it, this this theme, there's this uh, movie called The Believer, um, uh, about neo Nazi, and he was talking about the, the, like, well, what would you do to start revolution? He's like, I would kill Jews because everyone would hear that and they think that's exactly what I was thinking. And in a lot of ways, with this kind of Pepe meme um, what, and this this like anti immigrant anger, what they did was give people permission to drop the work they did on themselves and kind of just give in to what was implicit in the culture, which was anti immigrant hatred. So when people they did those sorts of things, how build the wall? There's a large portion of of basically young white men they were like that's exactly what i was thinking um you know and so they were able to mobilize in a lot of ways what was already there i think that honestly working on our ability to communicate with people in general um we will do better at because we organize and they really don't um, i think i don't want to overvalue their like memedom as actually influencing the culture and the way that organized coordinated action does um that's what really creates a larger effects. That's what builds movements beyond just this one thing. Because, you know, we this struggle wouldn't just stop at fighting the alt right. You know, if the alt right was gone today, if they completely dissolved, there would still be police murders every single day. There would still be a boss in every workplace. There would still be these struggles happening all the time. And so, what we have the advantage of doing is we can go after a lot of those talking points and issues, but we can organize at the same time. And that's even like I think I would say infinitely more powerful in the end. Also, just just to add real quick, like the alt right is not necessarily great at getting their message out on their own. Like we get our message out, and then they capitalize on it. Yeah. They're like, yeah, like you know, single like single payer healthcare. That's a really great idea for white people, you know, or like you know, like just like. They they capitalize on our movements and they turn everything like genuine and honest into like corruption and deceit, and the whole fascist movement and history bears this out is like fraud and betrayal. Um, so, like, how do we confront that? Right? Is like is the is the quite like like we can't have like lefties broing down with richard spencer on national tv right like we can't have like debates with fascists just be like oh we're gonna treat this as like a normal ideology right like and we need to oppose um journalists and media sources that are you know, uncritically helping them get their ideas out there. And I don't necessarily think that that's happening as much anymore. It was really in, it was really during the election season that... It still happens some. It happens some, <laughs> definitely. Um, but it was during the election season when just like this deluge of stuff from like the New York Times, like all over, just like... Antifa is really breaking down social order. Here's Richard Spencer. You know, it's like <laughs> he's not a fucking correspondent. He's a Nazi. He is the like, of the day. Yeah, yeah, but but they're they're like they're kind of savvy up at turning things around for their own usage, right? And that's the issue. We can't just let things. We can't pretend that things are neutral. Uh, and that they belong to us by nature, right? Except for, you know, the argument, the, the main principle of equality, uh, uh, anti-hierarchy, uh, equality against hierarchy, 
um, there's really nothing that they won't steal. It's also not new. I mean, like the Nazis would blast parody songs over the border so that uh, enemy troops could hear them and stuff like that. Like these tactics have gone on for years and years and years. Um, and so I think it's, it is important to confront um, essentially their opportunities to make um, their public case known because it's not just them talking, it's them organizing. Uh, so y'all both just mentioned Richard Spencer and you did previously. I'm from Michigan and I just recently graduated from Michigan State and Richard Spencer is scheduled to speak there on March 5th with yeah. Kyle Bristow and the whole gang. Kyle Bristow is a Michigan State graduate. Um, after like a bunch of, like a lawsuit, but they won. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering what you think, or just if you could talk a little bit more about what Richard Spencer and what you see as the trajectory for him and like the frat boy haircut people. <laughs> <laughs> the fashy swoop? Yeah. Um, all right, so Richard Spencer will focus on state universities almost yeah. exclusively. Um, so that, this goes back for a number of years. I mean, people heard of American Renaissance. That was, at least until recently, was the largest white nationalist conference. A lot of pseudo-intellectuals, a lot of like bell curve style race and IQ arguments, you know, discredited academics and stuff. They were shut down by the One People's Project in 2010, 2011, because they did these basically kind of micro campaigns to get no hotel to host them. And they'd get like people from around to do call-ins, and basically it became untenable. And what they resulted in was uh, Montgomery Bell State Park in Tennessee, and it's, it's run by the state, and there are some provisions in there that basically make it really difficult to cancel them or to make it so that they can't rent from there. Basically, they use a free speech argument. It was held, held in courts, and therefore they get to use this year after year after year. And Richard Spencer used that model to start going after public facilities, and he saw public universities as the best one. One, because they want to recruit on universities. They want young um, like good looking people um, that's like a really big part of it they want people that look like they go to schools um, in state universities the case has been made in public court that you can't pull it for reasons that appear ideological and so that case was made at Texas A&M a while back and it was upheld so he was able to speak there and what happened when I mean, tens of thousands of people came out to that that was a massive massive show then um uh, University of Florida, Gainesville, Auburn University, um, Michigan State has been a big battle. Same with Ohio, um, and him winning there is a big loss, right? But I don't think we can depend on courts to uphold these things, right? Um, and frankly, if they do uphold them, they'll probably turn that back on us at some point. Um, and, and we can't expect the administration to do it. Frankly, I mean, college administrators don't get this, and they're not going to. Uh, but what colleges do have is lots of people, um, and frankly, lots of student organizations, especially at, at in Michigan. And so, um, campus fascist, anti-fascist network, uh, we'll be working on that. Um, I, I mean, I think I, I think depending also on, on groups like the IWW's General Defense Committee to come out to universities has been really, really dependable, and to bringing out mass formations. Um, and, and I think what we're seeing in some schools um, in Wisconsin, um, Twin Cities, um, uh, Berkeley, uh, was that like large kind of coalitions of groups that kind of organized maybe somewhat differently, but they each kind of made up a patchwork that was really effective together. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see at Michigan. The question is whether or not the event can get canceled. Um, and I think that's a more complicated one. Um, but I think no matter what, like organizations have used this as efforts to grow so much more and so if basically those organizations can counter Richard Spencer by using it as a much 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 larger mobilization for anti-fascists then we should come out stronger and limit the ability of him to do that recruitment and also at this point Richard Spencer has become kind of like a sideshow on campuses like he's not doing like serious speeches and stuff. So like, you know, we watched Richard Spencer years ago, he would do these kind of pseudo-academic speeches, but they were well-written and researched, so you could at least give him that. Um, now it's like a jovial, it's embarrassing, and I don't think, I think at this point, the opposition is so massive that it's becoming uh, almost like a liability. Um, He's embarrassing himself on stage, yeah. and, and and the alt right is is like open about it. They're like, why is he even doing this anymore? Like, he just like 
waves his hands and yells, not articulating anything. I think what's scarier is Bristow's, uh, Kyle Bristow's is his attorney, um, is his, his mass of lawsuits that's proving that they can bully their way on the college campuses and force students to pay for it. Um, and so but I think but w when that happens, there's a lot of levers that students have because this is funded by students. So there's a lot of long-term organizing. And I think it actually goes back to the fact that students need to take back their universities in general, mm -hmm. that they're paying absorbent, these massive <laughs> fees and tuition for institutions that don't have their best interests at heart, aren't preparing them for like well-paying jobs, um, and are, are racking up huge administrative costs for people that are just going to go ahead and let Richard Spencer come. Um, so I, what I'm excited to see coming up is what happens in Michigan with a large kind of university system of what they're going to do to coordinate because they were coordinating walkouts yeah. and students. So they were doing a lot already, and that shows that I think that they, they really want to, they're, they're going to take that on in a serious way. And I think uh, like at University of Florida, Gainesville, they did it in a very, very serious way. There was large community coalitions, including like NGOs, like Planned Parenthood was on board with it. Um, but then also, uh, I mean, there was IWW members, but there was also really big student groups of people that hadn't really gotten involved before, but were really excited to get involved now. Um, and so I, I think if, if, if he's going to make this the tour of recruitment, then we have to match with like, like the tour of resistance, sort of. I wonder if you could talk about their tactic of doxing, because you talked about that really heartening show in Boston of 40,000 people, but doxing is so disabling because it's so atomizing. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, doxing, people do not know, that's the, the revealing of, of personal information about someone. Um, so anti-fascists have used doxing for a long time. It's still in this country pretty unpopular to be an open white supremacist, like an open white, white nationalist. Um, and so what a lot of anti-fascist groups would do is a very focused and targeted doxing. They reveal someone's information. And with the kind of the community coming together to let their employer or their landlord or their family know so that they get kind of isolated, it raises the social cost of participating so people don't feel like they can hide and that they're being targeted. They've tried to flip that back on the left. I, I, I don't want to discount that, it's a, that it hurts people on the left. But they do it so poorly. It's really badly done. Like, it's, just, it's done so ineffectively um, that I... I, I I know people are often very concerned about that, and I don't want to take away from that, but like, I'll see these like docs Antifa pages, and they'll be posting po photos of 600 people at once. Yeah. You do that, it renders it completely like uh, unimportant, no one cares, and it doesn't do anything. Um, I think there's... And they're also just like, not Antifa people. No. They're just like people, somebody like with a specials bumper sticker or something, they're like, Antifa's right there. There's someone who likes a <laughs> meme on Facebook and they go through and see all the people who liked it and then post their photos up somewhere. Um, the reason that doxing meant something was that it really sucks to be a neo-Nazi to your friends and stuff like that. It doesn't suck no, to be a like person Nazis. who likes something on Facebook. Yeah. And so like they have to have something that does that. The, I think the other side of that threat is, does that mean that they're coming to my house? or they're coming for me personally. Um, and we've yet to see that actually play out in that way. Their violence is much less well thought out generally, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. Which I think the answer to that part of it is about creating strong community bonds where people who do feel threatened, not just from them, but from anybody, are able to rely on each other and create those networks so that we're secure in that way. Um, if you feel concerned, it's an option, Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I think I think as they, they try and do this like doxing of people, it hasn't worked out. There are situations when it has been, uh, I think, a little different. And I don't know if it's really the doxing as much as it's just targeted harassment. So like we're seeing a lot of like yeah. professors on college Prefer, campuses. Yeah. Um, um, Threatened. Yeah, most recently David at, at Stanford. There's there's been a lot of people where basically they they might be a part of some organized group or maybe they make a joke on Twitter that is really easy to take out of context and put on uh, like a Heat Street website, um, and then people basically harass them until they get in trouble. Uh, Tariq Khan at um, at I guess it's University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign mm -hmm. uh, has been having that. A, a graduate student and a friend. Uh, 
uh, who's basically just had Turning Point USA, which is kind of like a, a an alt right leaning campus group tied to a lot of those kind of like trashy online websites websites like Campus Reform, of uh, just harassing him endlessly, going after his family, going after the department, trying to get him to lose his scholarship and all those sorts of things. Um, so I think that is definitely happening really heavily. And what the alt right has proven is that harassment and threats. Um, even if they seem vacant, or that can be a, the real damaging thing. Um, but their use of people's information, they just they just do it so poorly. Mm-hmm. They're bad at it. <laughs> when it comes to organizing anything, they are really bad at it, and I don't think we should ever discount how ineffective they can be. Um, yeah. I was just going to add to that. One of the like kind of differences between the left doxing people and the right doxing people is typically when the left dox people doxes people there's social consequences when the right doxes people it turns into just like an ongoing harassment campaign Mm -hmm. and we've already seen that like you can be charged for that like the splc is going after andrew angling currently for the like Mm -hmm. harassment campaign against the one in whitefish so like it's yes it's laughable i agree but like I, i just wanted to throw like a different piece of I, I think also that with the SBLC's lawsuit, what they're doing is a civic civil lawsuit. So yes. they're suing Andrew yes. Anglin. And the SBLC has done this really effectively in the past with different things. They brought down White Aryan Resistance by with their lawsuit. They yeah. brought down United Clans of America and Aryan Nations, uh, Aryan Nations was gone through a lawsuit. So um, uh, it's less clear whether or that'll work in this case, but I think yeah, I mean Andrew Anglin also went above board and like threatened he was bringing skinheads right. in with automatic weapons and stuff like that. Um, see a hand in the back. <laughs> well, uh, how does these conversations play into the ice raids? Into ice the ice raids. Oh, oh That's my goodness! Thing. I've been wanting to say this actually all day. One of the really r- ridiculous things about um, about Richard Spencer is like him talking about this sort of white nationalist platform that Trump has put forward using that number of 11 million people, which the white nationalist uh, Tanton network uh, created themselves and probably got to him through Chris Kobach of Kansas, uh, one of the guys who's, uh, who was on their uh, now defunct uh, voter authenticity uh, group. Um, and had been the author of SB 1070, the Papers Please Bill, through ALEC, which was um, pushed through the Arizona Senate by a guy named Russell Pierce, who was in bed with uh, uh, JT Reddy of the of the uh, National Socialist Movement. So Trump was actually putting forward like a white nationalist anti-immigration platform when he was running for president. And continuing to through Numbers USA and a number of other Tanton Network uh, affiliates. And, 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 you know, so Richard Spencer in, in you know, aggressively promoting that um, uh, policy or those policies uh, when asked about, like, well, who's going to pick the, the produce? Like, if you want to expel all the, uh, you know, uh, workers, uh, agricultural workers in, like, the Central Coast, Central Valley. Um, And he goes, we can pick them our damn selves. And guess what the hell is rotting on the vines right now in Central Coast and Central Valley? Because, you know, a lot of white people don't really want to work in the fields. And Richard Spencer, this is where Richard Spencer's white supremacism just sort of falls flat. It's like uh, opposition to a system that's kind of already system that is already systemically racist and enforcing a kind of like racialized caste system on uh, guest workers, on migrant workers, migrant labor, and trying to up the ante on racism over that. And that's kind of what we're seeing Trump do with the ICE, uh, 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 the intensification of ICE raids in places like California um, that are, you know, most sort of uh, um, hateful to his to his policies. And and something that's really interesting about this as well, and its parallels to uh, Nazism, is that. Um, 
what you find if you research uh, Nazi Germany is that there are overlapping agencies of power that are constantly compromising one another and basically stepping on each other's toes. And Hitler played the role of sort of mediator, basically, you know, picking who was right at what time. But there was really a lot more chaos than order because you had the empowerment of so many authoritarians. And in places like Portland, we've seen ICE go to um, the courts when like a, a migrant is, is called to court for whatever traffic ticket or something, ICE is there trying to swoop them up, asking them for papers and stuff like that. So really uh, obvious uh, uh, jurisdiction problem there. And they were told not to, right, by, by the municipal government. Um, and they've still kind of, they're still doing this sort of really predatorial over uh, over uh, uh, encroachment onto the jurisdiction of other places, waiting outside of public schools for a migrant to drop off their kids, right? Like truly insidious stuff that obviously are, you know, pointed to um, to trigger to traumatize yeah, yeah, people, yeah. to traumatize families, and to and to traumatize uh, co uh, communities. I'm originally from Southern California, and there's a lot of going on down like Santa Ana and stuff there right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of like friends of mine and families are just, they're terrified yeah. Yeah. right now. El Paso, um, a, a, lot, a lot of communities, Southern Arizona. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things is that, that um, the same things that we use in terms of community defense, if people are being threatened by white supremacists in their neighborhoods, um, rapid response networks build responding to those things with the same tools that can use to confront deportations and what we'll need to do because the thing that stops it is not uh, just electoral strength of changing some kind of abstract policy but it's communities on the ground doing it directly and saying that they won't tolerate that um, a strong community one that really has a stake in each other and solidarity and mutual aid that has the ability to resist a lot um, and I think that has the ability to transform what the conversation is about that. Um, and so I, I think a lot of people are doing that. And I think also the other thing is that looking at what institutions, organizations, and projects already exist and seeing how they can be mobilized that. So, you know, in Portland, we've there's a sanctuary of churches uh, where people can go into the church, won't get, refuses to participate with ICE. Um, there's sanctuary unions that put these policies in CBAs, <coughs> in collective bargaining agreements. Um, there's a lot of things that, that, that can be kind of transformed to be a part of that as long as there's a real conscious effort to say why this is important and how this plays into a larger strategy. Because I think when those things happen, not just is like anti-fascism or, 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 or immigrant support is, uh, strengthened, but also the movements that existed before are strengthened as well. You know, labor, labor movement is stronger when they stand with immigrants, you know? Um, and so I think relying on that, those kind of networks that exist and building up stronger is really important. And I think I, I think that's I think we're over our time already. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Yeah, for thank so you long. very much. <laughs>